Category 5 Hurricane Barrel continues gaining strength on its way to Jamaica after leaving a trail of destruction in St. Vincent and the Grandins. Bolivia rejected the Argentinian government's statement that described the failed coup attempt against President Luis Arce as a false accusation. In Palestine, the Sinanese Occupation Army orders a new exodus of Han Yunis residents after days of continuous siege. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Lesu Studios in Havana, Cuba. We'll begin with the news. As Hurricane Barrel, now at Category 5 hurricane, ravages several Caribbean countries, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grandins, Ralph Gonsalves, blamed rich countries for their unwillingness to address climate change. The regional leader has called on Western countries to honor their commitments to tackle the effects of global warming. The Premier warned that the climate issue has disappeared from the electoral agendas of Europe and the United States because, in his opinion, it is not an issue that would generate votes for them. He stressed that the main emitters of greenhouse gases took a big deal, but do little in practice. On the other hand, Gonzalez addressed the devastation caused by the meteorological event on the island and assured the population that the country would rebuild and go back to normal. Hurricane Barrel strengthens on its way to Jamaica after passing over Grenada, where authorities reported one person killed. Barrel is now a potentially catastrophic Category 5 storm. Experts warn that this first hurricane of the season has worrisome records, evidencing the serious effects of climate change. Barrel, which formed on Saturday night, intensified rapidly on Sunday to a Category 4. It is now the earliest storm on this scale on record in the Atlantic. Scientists explain that it is surprising that it took Barrel less than 72 hours to go from a tropical depression to a Category 5 hurricane. Well, we were more or less expecting it, because five meter waves were expected, but nevertheless, this is the first time, even during a cyclone, that we've seen the sea as rough as this. It's really the first time this has happened in St. Luce. In the end, Beryl washed everything away, as you can see, and it will take several days to get everything back in order, especially at the start of the summer holidays. In Barbados, Hurricane Barrow left a trail of havoc in the Fisher Folk on its way through the Caribbean country. With more information, Crystal Hoyde from CBC News. A nightmare for fishing boat owners and operators as their livelihoods taken by a surging sea driven by storm force winds from Category 4 Hurricane Barrow. These boats represent millions of dollars in investment. At least 20 are lost, smashed until they sink below the surface. Scores more suffer significant damage from the battering waves. Honestly, we just hoping for the best. You understand? I have watched three boats sink so far since I've been here. You understand? I've watched one break in half. So much destruction is in here right now. So much destruction. This is my livelihood. Pray for our families. There's nothing more we can do. We can't even save the boats. We tried. We were trying for the whole morning to save. We can't. Fishermen were out there trying to, to help pull them out, trying to, trying to get them tied on together. They had to jump off their boats for their safety. Everything is mashed up. Jetty gone, everything. And more boats are sinking. She says it's a huge financial loss. One of these boats, maybe a, a wood boat, 160,000, 170,000. That's a wood boat. Imagine a uh, fiberglass. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And I'm not exaggerating. This is millions and millions of dollars. Stephen Bourne, who lost two of his boats, says the fishing industry has been heavily impacted and he's already predicting shortages. It's a blow completely to the whole fishing industry in Barbados because majority of the fishing boats in the complex who is sinking mash up, all of them have damages. Chairman of the Fisheries Advisory Committee, Kimar Harris, could not give a full assessment of the situation, but notes that even the jetty was damaged. The number of boats that we have lost that have actually sunk and broken up, we do not know. You see surges are coming in as hard as possible and it's actually crashing boats and so forth. Most of you look around, most of the fishermen and boat owners are here, but 
Men are in tears, women are in tears. This is a tough time now for the fishing industry. Chief Fisheries Officer Dr. Shelly Ann Cox has been undertaking preliminary assessments. It's the first step to determine the full scope of this devastating blow to the fishing industry. Crystal Hoyt, CBC News. Barbados Prime Minister may among the citizens to be vigilant and follow the authorities' measures to avoid further damage. This stage is just to get order here, and as you can see, I don't want anybody being injured. So I want to make sure that they give the reports, but we keep people from the back. So I go in and do a last check. You all don't need to come with me. Just stay here because I don't want nobody else going back down in there, especially with them smells of diesel being as strong as they are. The port has really taken a battering both on land and in the water. Um, I'm told that two vessels sunk, the Jolly Roger, um, which is already, because it was wood, started to dissipate and some of it, the Harbour Masters indicated, has started to float out the Dream Chaser, which has gone down below. Um, I have asked the Chairman of the Port and the CEO for the Port to have an emergency board meeting this evening so that they can start to deal with the question of recovery and cleanup as a matter of urgency. They are a commercial entity capable of self-containment and doing their own stuff, and therefore we will await to get the report. But you can see, quite frankly, what the storm surge has brought in here. Um, and you heard when we were down the road there at the Fisher Harbour that nobody has ever seen this scale of waves come on this side, and therefore it is part and parcel, as I said, of what I call the season of superlatives. And we have, therefore, to build to higher levels for the resilience that we need. The immediate needs is to bring the port as operational, uh, operational as, um, as soon as possible. That means moving all of these rocks that have come in from the ocean floor. You can see that the buildings there have damaged, the walls have been damaged. Um, so there is both damage onshore and in the water. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Teleso English, where you'll find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. For the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. Bolivia rejected the Argentine government statement that described the failed coup attempt against President Lizard's Catacora as a false accusation. The tension between Buenos Aires and La Paz escalated on Monday after the Bolivian foreign ministry described as unfriendly and reckless the Argentine government statement. The ministry condemned President Javier Malay's remarks about the failed coup, while the Bolivian minister for the presidency, Maria Nela Prada, informed that the President Luis Arce had summoned his ambassador in Buenos Aires for consultations. We inform the Bolivian people and the international community that the government of the plurinational state of Bolivia has decided to summon the newly appointed ambassador of the Republic of Argentina in our country to express our energetic rejection of the statements made by the Office of the President of the Republic of Argentina, Javier Milei. Likewise, our ambassador of the plurinational state of Bolivia in Argentina, Ramiro Capia, was summoned in consultation to be present at the seat of government. The judiciary of Peru ordered the immediate reinstatement of magistrates Aldo Vasquez and Ines Tello as members of the National Board of Justice. The first constitutional chamber of the Supreme Court of Justice of Lima declared both magistrates' immunity requests as being substantially founded in order that they be immediately reinstated in their position as members of the National Board of Justice. The resolution was disclosed on Monday, four months after Congress disqualified them from public office for 10 years. According to the court, the resolutions that declared the disqualification of the two magistrates are inapplicable. The Haitian government, with the support of law enforcement officials, regained control of the Interior Ministry in Port-au-Prince. Prime Minister Gary Conneal issued the security measures aimed at recovering control of the territorial communities. The Prime Minister reported the actions took place in the presence of a magistrate 
Cornell assured that they are working to start damage assessment and repairs necessary to restore the activities at the ministry with suitable conditions for its functioning. Pedro Pierluisi, governor of Puerto Rico, announced on Monday the call for a new referendum on the political status of the island to be held on November 5th, coinciding with the general elections. In his remarks, Pierre Lucy stressed the importance of Puerto Rico continuing to exert pressure and greater in its right to self-determination to be a free country that does not obey U.S. federal laws. This new referendum represents a crucial step on the road to resolving Puerto Rico's political status, an issue that has generated debate and discussion for decades. With the date set for November 5th, Puerto Rican citizens are expected to actively participate in this important consultation that will define the political future of the island. Meanwhile, in Venezuela, President Nicolás Maduro authorized the resumption of dialogue with the United States in Doha, Qatar. During the broadcast of his program with Con Maduro Mas, the head of the Venezuelan states affirmed a new cycle is beginning in which Caracas and Washington will hold meetings in public. This after the president denounced the failure of the United States to comply with what was previously agreed in secret meetings between the two governments. In this sense, the Venezuelan president stated that one of the key issues will be the lifting of the sanctions imposed against Venezuela in order to advance in the economic understanding and the improvement of quality of life of Venezuelan people. I am a man of dialogue, and through dialogue I want Venezuela to be respected, to make our country, its democracy, its people respected. I want to overcome this zero-sum conflict, a conflict of brutal and stereo confrontation with them. With the North, it is up to them to honor it. For two continuous months, I have received from the government of the United States the proposal to reestablish talks and the direct dialogue. After thinking about it for two months, I have accepted and next Wednesday The talks with the government of the United States to reestablish talks and direct dialogue will be resumed so that it complies with the agreements signed in Qatar and to reestablish the terms of the dialogue with respect, without manipulation, and also that they are public dialogues without a speculation. We continue in Venezuela, President Nicolás Maduro led on Monday the presentation of the National Journalism Award Simón Bolívar 2024 in its 82nd edition. The ceremony took place in the Ayacucho Hall of the Presidential Palace in Metaflores. The awards were presented in different categories such as television, print, radio, graphic image, opinion, cultural teaching and research, digital journalism, among others. This way, the national government reaffirmed its commitment and support to national and international journalists in their work to make the truth known and keep the people informed in an objective manner in the struggle against injustice. In this sense, the head of state paid tribute to journalist Julian Assange, thus demonstrating his support to journalists who fight for freedom of expression and the right to be informed. The president also presented the National Television Journalism Award to journalist Luis Guillermo Garcia Bencomo for his journalistic work in his program El Mundo Desde el Sur, broadcast on our multi-platform news channel Telesur, in which he offers analysis and perspectives on world current affairs from the point of view of the peoples of Latin America. And the National Electoral Council of Venezuela described as overwhelming the participation of citizens during the simulation held on Sunday ahead of the presidential elections of July 28th. The president of the governing body, Elvis Amoroso, highlighted the work of the CNE in the 335 municipalities of the national territory, where he also congratulated the people of Venezuela for the assistance in the electoral exercises. Amoroso also pointed out that the electoral participation extended until 9 o'clock at night in some of the institutions authorized to vote. After the simulation, the Electoral Council detailed the speed of the electoral process, which was estimated to be around 38 seconds per border. It is of utmost importance to highlight the presence of the international observers, many of whom are here today. From the Carter Center, the United Nations, the Council of Electoral Experts of Latin America, 
Slack, and other election-related personalities from the five continents who are in our country. We now have a fun short break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English-speaking audience, you can scan the QR code on screen to join directly, share the link to reach more people. Comes on news coverage of Latin American and Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Fun short break, don't go away. Welcome back. The Israeli occupation army has been besieging thousands of civilians in Hanjunis for several days while they order a new exodus of its residents. In this sense, the Zionist government of Tel Aviv resumed a new wave of forced displacement of residents of Gaza towards the central and western areas of that region, including the area of Al Mawasi, despite it being one of the most bombed areas. In this regard, recent reports from the United Nations highlight that in the last few days, about 84,000 people have been displaced in the Gaza Strip following the new escalation of bombardments. Israel's genocidal operation in Gaza continues, aggravated by the threat of an imminent famine and the continued obstruction of humanitarian aid by the Zionist forces. In Palestine, the death toll of Palestinians killed by the Israeli army in Gaza almost reaches 38,000 people. The health ministry announced that death toll does not include the 13,000 bodies that remain under the rubble, which are impossible for ambulances and rescue teams to access due to constant attacks by the Israeli army. The office also reported that the number of deaths, more than 15,000 are children, more than 10,000 are women, 500 medical personnel, 152 journalists and 33 died of starvation. Palestinian Red Crescent Society also confirmed that more than 2 million people have been displaced and that more than 195 government offices, 435 schools and universities, 810 mosques and 3 churches have been destroyed. Iran concluded the first electoral debate between the candidates who reached the second stage of the presidential elections, Masoud Pesiskian and Said Jalili, who focused on political and cultural issues. The event started at 9.30 p.m. local time. During the activity, both candidates expressed their opinions regarding economic issues in which they discussed the development of the country at the international level. Likewise, Pesiskian and Jalili talked about the low participation of citizens during the first round of the elections. Meanwhile, candidate Jalili highlighted the participation of women during the electoral process and indicated that a government plan should also be drawn up for them. The Constitutional Council of Iran confirmed on June 30th the results of the June 28th presidential elections, authorizing the candidates to begin campaigning for the second round of the election on July 5th. The spokesman for the Council of Guardians of the Islamic Republic, Hadi Dahan Nasif, reported that after the presentation of the election results, none of the presidential contenders filed complaints with the Constitutional Council. He also indicated that more than 24 million people participated in the elections to choose the new Iranian president following the death of Ibrahim Raisi in a helicopter crash last May 19. Now on Copa America 2024, the United States, by virtue of its loss to Uruguay, was eliminated in the third day of Group C. The Charruas team achieved a perfect score after winning all three matches of the first round and the U.S. got eliminated by the defeat and Panama's win over Bolivia. Group C ended with Uruguay as the absolute leader with three wins and nine points, followed by Panama with six. Meanwhile, the United States third with three points and Bolivia last with no points were eliminated. In this stage, the South Americans will play against the second group D of Group D, Brazil, who will face tomorrow the leader, Colombia, in the most interesting match of the initial phase.
We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesfinglish.net. So join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesfinglish, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.